And so this is often what we deal with in the field, is looking at these small changes in gravity over bodies. And this is a CG5, so you might have heard me speak about it. This is an instrument that has a sensitivity in the field, we said, of 0.04 milligrams. Although when they sell it to you, they'll say to you, actually, you can measure anomalies as small as 0.001 milligrams, but not in real life, and at least not with students doing the measurements. Each station takes about 5 to 10 minutes, so it's not that quick. Um, you actually also need a GPS. You can't use your handheld GPS, those small ones. Those small GPSs or the ones you use in your car are accurate to about 5 meters. So there's an error of about 5 meters. You need a GPS that is down to centimeters or millimeter level. And so we have a differential GPS. That's where you see DGPS differential means it uses two GPS and, and helps you get down to very good accuracy. Um, you measure on the gravity pegs. So it's quite a process. You have a little tripod underneath, you put that in the soil, and you step on it, and you put the gravity meter on the, uh, the tripod, and the gravity meter has to be absolutely level. It can't be tilted at all. So that's what takes time. You have to level it, um, and then you measure for about a minute. So that's why it can take five to ten minutes to make a measurement. You also need a base station. So that's what this DS here is, a base station. And so you can't just go out and measure gravity for the whole day. What happens is every two to three hours, you have to come back to your base station and make a measurement at the base station. Because the gravity at the base station will change throughout the day. And it's not because it's actually changing, it's because your instrument is changing. There's a slight drift in the instrument. And we assume that it's a linear change. And so if I've got several measurements at this point throughout the day, I can minus out that linear change. You'll see. We'll give it a try. Something else that you've got to do, which adds in even more time, is you've got to do repeat measurements. Because you want to show your client that, well, the reading at the beginning of the day was similar to the reading I did at the end of the day, so the data's good quality. As you can see, these are all loops that have been done, um, and then you return to your base station. And they've got several overlaps between them. And so these overlapping points take extra time, and it's not actually adding to your survey. So you've just got to t take this into account when you, do it, when you tell your client how much time you're going to take to do the survey. You might have the whole day, but you've still got to go to the base station, you've still got to do your checks. So it always cuts back on your productivity time. Something else to keep in mind is that you always do your gravity survey at 90 degrees to your geological body. And so you can see this is a dark, so we're looking down from the top down onto this. The dive is going north south. We are going to walk east west or west east. You can do a survey slightly off from 90 degrees. It just makes it a little bit more complicated, especially in magnetics. So we always try to go at 90 degrees. Something else that's very important is how often am I going to take a measurement? We experienced this a bit in the software when we first started it last Wednesday. We had to put in our station spacing. How often were we going to take a measurement? And it's quite important. We said you can't take a measurement every meter because that's going to take you two weeks. And you can't take a measurement every one kilometer because you're going to miss out on information in between. So how do you decide how often to take a measurement? And so this, I want to show you an example here. So this is the surface of the Earth, this black line separating the blue and the red. So it's zero meters. This red body here with the red pluses is a high density body. So let's say, for example, it's got a density of 3.0 grams per centimeter cubed. Maybe the background is 2.6 grams per centimeter cubed. So it's going to cause a positive anomaly, like you've been seeing in the one. And so this red area here is the anomaly. So that's the anomaly here, but my units are in milligrams. So say, for example, I took a measurement in these red blocks, these red triangles, before and after the actual curve. I'm going to miss this curve completely. I don't have any measurement line. So my data is going to look like a dotted line through those triangles. I wouldn't even know that there's an anomaly there. Um, so that's undersampling. You're not making enough measurements. The red line there, you can see, is what I would get. And that is termed aliasing. So literally, you've changed your data because you haven't sampled enough. 
we want to sample on the blue dot. So often enough that we're going to get the whole curve, a picture of the whole curve, but not too often that it's going to cost us too much money. So that's why the software is very important, because before you go into the field, you would actually create a model, say this is what I'm expecting, therefore I should sample this often. And so it's something that you would use when making that calculation is the Nyquist frequency. And so it's the minimum rate at which the signal can be sampled without introducing error. So these triangles are the minimum times I can sample without introducing an error, and an error is this red line. I'm, I'm losing an anomaly. And it's equal to two times the highest frequency present in the signal. Okay, so you literally are going to have to take your signal, work out the wavelength, then convert that into frequency, and then double the highest frequency. That should be your sampling. So for example, if my shortest wavelength in my data is 10 meters, does everyone remember how to convert wavelength into frequency? Frequency is V over that. Because then we've got meters per second over meters. Those cancel out and we're left with per second. So velocity wise, the velocities in the rocks, you can read them off of different tables. Um, let's assume 5,000 meters per second over the wavelength of 10 meters is equal to, and those cross out, 500 hertz. And two times the highest frequency, so our Nyquist frequency, Fny is equal to two times this, converting back into wavelength. Wavelength is equal to V over frequency. So V is 5,000 over the frequency of 1,000. So you're going to sample every 5 meters. But that's how you would use this Nyquist frequency to determine how often you want to sample your data. But that's the most important thing is cost. And you actually do this in your honors year when you do the field school. You have to put forward a bid. You put forward your sampling rate, um, but you have to calculate the cost. We give you how much you would charge a laborer per day, how many stations they can do in a day, and you've actually got to uh, balance out the two. So I've got an example in the PowerPoint. Something else that's very important with gravity and can take a bit of time is you don't just get your data and create a map out of it. You've actually got to correct your data. So there's several corrections that you have to apply to your data. So um, in this example, they've got an aeroplane flying. You do get airborne gravity, but it's not that common because of the shakiness of the plane. It can introduce quite a bit of error. So you often mainly have ground gravity, but you can have airborne gravity as well. So you acquire the data, and then we have data reduction. So data reduction is the same as data correction. First thing is sensor velocity correction. So you actually have to correct for the fact that the, the sensor is moving, your gravity meter is moving. You don't do this when you're on the ground because you literally stop and you take the measurement. And then the aeroplane is moving constantly and measuring constantly. The plane doesn't stop. It's the same on a ship. They actually do um, ship gravity in the oceans, um, often to do with seismic data. They correlate the two for oil and gas. Then there's a tidal correction. Um, and I'll come back to that. A drift correction is what we spoke about already. It's this, over time, your gravity meter is measuring slightly different uh, values. That's why you have your base station. So it's this linear change over time. And you're actually going to uh, correct for that. That's your drift correction. Latitude correction. Remember, we spoke about on um, Friday the fact that your gravity changes at different latitudes. And so, was gravity more or less at the poles versus the equator? If you need to think about it, if you're over here, the poles are been squashed, so you're slightly closer to the center of the Earth, the gravity is higher. The equator, you're further away, the gravity is less. And so obviously, as you come down latitudes, it's going to affect your gravity measurement. So you need to correct for the latitude. Free air correction, um, you need to correct for the fact that you're not on a flat surface going along, you're going up and down along the topography. And the Bouguet correction is a 
as I'm already doing here quite often, that you're creating for the fact that as you're going up and down the topography, you've actually got this slab of rock underneath you that's affecting your gravity values. And so obviously at the coast, when, there's, when I'm closer to sea level, um, I don't have as much rock beneath me as I do up in Johannesburg, where I've got this whole um, one kilometer of rock beneath me. So these are several corrections that you need to make to the data. So to give you a chance calculating, so a horizontal sill that extends well outside the survey area will go through it. Now that has a thickness of 30 meters and a density of 500 kilograms per meter cube in excess of the rocket and cubes. Estimate the maximum depth at which it would be detectable using a gravity meter that can measure 0.1 millimeter. Let's break it down. Horizontal sill is literally as a, a long intrusion into the ground, so it's a horizontal layer. Um, and usually in South Africa, it's intruding into sandstone. Um, and so the, the sill itself has a higher density than the surrounding rocks. And it extends outside the survey area. The main thing it's trying to tell you this, that it extends well outside the survey area is that you're not hitting the edges of the sill. And so its thickness is about 30 meters. Density contrast is 500 kilograms per meter cube. You know it contrasts because it's in, in excess of the rocket intrusion. And you also know from the other day when we looked at density values, we never looked at such small density values. Uh, sandstone was about 2,550, and some of your higher rocks got up to about 3,000. So that's how you know that contrast. Estimate the maximum depth at which it will be detectable using a gravity. And so if you think of your software that you've just done, and you can actually, we should maybe do it both ways. You can do it in the software and you can do a calculation. This is our screen, and we're putting in a horizontal tabular structure, which is our saw below the surface at zero meter. We know that it's 30 meters thick, and we know that it has a density contrast of 500 kilograms per meter cubed. Your software deals in grams per centimeter cubed, that's why we are dealing with zero point something. So this as a gram per centimeter cube would be 0 0.5 grams per centimeter cube. What type of anomaly would we expect over this? Would we expect a positive or a negative curve? This is a positive. So we would be expecting something that goes up and goes down. This anomaly is because of the edges of the bottom. It's picking up the change in density between an outside rock and the sill, and again between the sill and an outside rock. Here in the middle, there's actually no change in density horizontally. There's a vertical change in density, but this measures horizontal changes in density. And so now they're wanting to know at what depth would you be able to detect the sill if you have a gravimeter that can measure to 0 0.1 millimeter depth. This means that the sensitivity of the gravity meter is 0.1 milligrams. That means anything smaller than that, it probably won't be able to detect. So they are asking you to find out at what depth this body will cause an anomaly that is 0.1 or bigger. Because anything less than 0.1, your gravity meter won't pick up. Okay, so quickly get on your screens. Go to your Grav2DC and click on a new model. Okay, so system options, begin a new model. And our initial body density, they told us, should be 0 0.5, because it was 500 kilograms per meter cubed. It's a sill, so it's probably not as extensive as a die. Um, so I'd say let's leave it at 100, the strike length. Maximum depth to span, you can leave it at 100. Unit, I'd say let's go down to meters because it's told us that the thickness is 30 meters, so we're working in meters. Let's change this maximum depth display to 200. Uncheck read in field data. Once you've done that, you can click OK. And now we're going to put in a sill. So put in a body like this for me. They did say that it actually it extends beyond the survey area, but let's for now do a small one inside of the survey area. So click OK. OK, just do a horizontal rectangle for me. 
four points right to close. Now they told us that the thickness is 30 meters. Go to edit the model, change a corner numerically. So edit the model, change a corner numerically. I'm going to retype everything so it looks pretty. So we're going to change it to 150 and a depth of 20. Click next corner. I'm going to change it to 800 and a depth of 20. Next corner, and again we're going to be 800, and this is now going to be 50 because we know that it's 30 meters thick. And then the last corner is back at 150 and 50. And click OK. Okay, can anybody see what the, u uh, what the values are? Mine, I have no values up here, so I can't tell whether the gravity needs to bring that up or not. Okay, so how did we change it? We double click on the top left. You've got to just play around here. I'm going to put 0 0.1. Let's see if it gives me anything. And so what we said is that um, the gravity meter can measure 0 0.1 or more. So they're saying to you in this problem here, Estimate the maximum depth at which it would be detectable using a gravity meter. So the maximum depth. So what is the deepest this sill can be and we will still see it on our gravity meter. So literally we're going to be moving the sill deeper until we can see that we will no longer be able to detect it. So I'm going to click on here. I'm changing my depth to five, uh, my increments to five. And as I move it down, you can see my values are changing on this axis, and you can see it's getting deeper. And I'm literally going to keep moving it down until I get to 0 0.1. So then I know that anything deeper than that, I can't pick up with my values. And it's gone off my screen now, but it's still there, it's still detecting it. Okay, so I mean about here. So I'm at a depth of about 255 meters. And I can't... I won't be able to detect it as it goes deeper. Well, even more, 265, kind of about, by the time we get to 280, 